Hi, my name is Brian, and I'm the pastor of Vision at Holy City Church. I'm glad that you found our online sermon resources, and I pray that the Lord would use them to strengthen your faith. I would exhort you not to use our online sermon resources as a substitute for regular involvement in your own local church. That being said, I pray that our teaching resources would be helpful to you and conform you even more to the image of Christ. Mark chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. And you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, Let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, Here is the Christ, or look, there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on your guard. I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, 
This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. So Lise and I have moved several times since we've got married. I uh, started out in Seneca, South Carolina, moved to Central, from Central to Pendleton, Pendleton back to Central, Central to Louisville, two different homes in Louisville, and then Louisville to Charleston. Every transition, especially as our family has grown, has become a time to toss stuff out. No, we're not keeping that. Yeah, toss that. No, throw that out. I, I didn't even know we still had that. We haven't been using that for a decade. Let's, let's throw that away. When you're in a state of transition from the old place, it's often a time to get rid of the old stuff. And when you transition into a new home, particularly a larger home, uh, you often need to pick up new stuff. So our house here on James Island has, has been our largest house by far. Um, I, I do have the mortgage payment to prove that. Um, and for example, like when we moved from, Jeru- uh, from Jerusalem, from Louisville, <laughs> we didn't move from Jerusalem. When we moved from uh, Louisville to James Island, uh, we had several like cheap Walmart or Target brand bookcases that had all of my school books. And, and we just tossed them. Uh, tossed them as we were coming down here, and, and we got uh, nicer bookshelves that, that would not break under the heavy weight of theology and systematic textbooks. Um, <clears throat> our, our home here needed a new oven, water heater, fridge, among other things. And a time of transition often means out with the old and in with the new. And the emphasis in Mark 13 is not primarily end times prophecy. That's not Mark or Jesus' main point, which may surprise some of you. Jesus is doing several things during this lengthy warning, but His primary point in all of this is out with the old, in with the new. Unbelieving Israel, particularly her wicked leaders, are being decisively judged. Christ's judgment against Israel is is the culmination of hundreds of years of disobedience. 1,500 years in failing to repent and believe God. And so Jesus is going to judge Israel and her false shepherds. with finality because they have rejected the very Christ that their God uh, promised. But as God does throughout the redemptive storyline, throughout the story of the Bible, He saves and redeems His people in the midst of His judgment against the wicked. He's tossing out the old, bringing in the new. The Lord Yahweh has rejected the unbelieving Jews of Israel, but He has now brought Gentiles into His community, those who trust Him by faith in Christ's gospel. So three points this morning. Three points. First point is repent and believe, for judgment starts in God's house. 
Repent and believe, for judgment starts in God's house. The second point, endure hardship faithfully because Christ has won. Endure hardship faithfully because Christ has won. And the third point is be ready and alert because Christ is returning. Be ready and alert because Christ is returning. In all of these things, Mark and Jesus want Jesus' people to endure. All right, first point. Repent and believe for judgment starts in God's house. So Mark 13 verses 1 and 2 really serve as a conclusion to Mark 11 and 12. So what Mark 11 and 12, what has been happening? Jesus has entered Jerusalem as the true son of David and the king. He's gone into the temple. He has judged the temple, cursed the fig tree, judged Israel's false leaders, tossed everybody out who, were, who had turned the temple into a den of thieves, and he has thoroughly confounded and trapped Israel's religious leaders as they have sought to oppose him. He's taught with unprecedented authority. And we see that the Sanhedrin really are wicked, false teachers. They are there to oppress God's people and to enrich themselves because they really hate the Lord and they twist the temple and its structures in order to serve themselves. They don't love the Lord by obeying His commands. They create their own commands in order to justify themselves before God and before God's people. So in Mark 13, when a disciple comes up to Jesus as he's leaving the temple, asks, Jesus, what do you think about this beautiful temple? Jesus totally rejects it. Now, the temple structure itself was impressive. It really was a wonder to behold. Herod had made this new temple. Solomon's temple had already been destroyed. It had been rebuilt, and then Herod built even more. So the temple of Jesus' day was large enough to fit 12 football fields in it. Each of the stones, the early Jewish historian Josephus tells us that each of the stones in the temple were 21 yards long apiece. It was amazing. But Jesus says the, the one who made the universe is not impressed. God will completely destroy it because of Israel's hardened unrepentance. And he moves to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus never returns back to the temple. Total judgment. Jesus is doing something really, really important here. Mark's intentional in this description so that we might understand the rest of what Jesus is saying throughout the rest of Mark 13. So, if you will, turn with me to Ezekiel 10. Ezekiel is the last of the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And as you're turning there and as you're looking at Ezekiel 10, I'll just give you a little bit of context. This is before the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Ezekiel is before this. God has appointed the prophet Ezekiel to warn Israel that judgment is coming. God calls Ezekiel the son of man, which is important. From Ezekiel 4 to 9, God warns Israel that He's going to destroy Jerusalem. He's going to destroy the temple because the nation, following their evil leaders, 
have disobeyed Him and have refused to repent. They've turned the temple into an abomination. So God's leaving. Does that sound familiar? In Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel sees a vision where the presence of the Lord is resting upon the temple. But then he sees the presence of the Lord lift off the temple, and the presence of the Lord moves over to the east gate and settles on the east gate. So a temple without God is a worthless temple. God is leaving Israel to their sins, and His judgment will lead to exile and Jerusalem's destruction at the hands of the Babylonians. Now, when the presence of God stops at the east gate after leaving the temple, God then pronounces a judgment of destruction against Israel's wicked leaders in Ezekiel 11. At the same time, God promises that He will provide a new salvation. He's going to give His people new hearts, new minds, a new spirit. God Himself will make His new people obedient. That's good news. And at the end of Ezekiel 11, you see the glory of the Lord move from the east gate and settle on the mountain that is east of the city. And then Ezekiel 12 to 16, God condemns Israel's wicked counselors, false prophets, describes the destruction of Jerusalem and her people, And promises to save Gentile nations because Israel sin along because of Israel sin along with giving a new covenant. As you move on from Ezekiel and read the rest of the Old Testament, nowhere do you see the presence of the Lord ever come back to the temple. The next time you see the presence of the Lord return to the temple is when the Spirit-empowered Son of God enters the temple in Mark 11. And what does He do? In Mark 11 to 12, we see Israel's situation is far worse than it was during the time of Ezekiel. Remember, the presence of the Lord leaves the temple after rebuking the status of the temple and rests on the east gate. Pronounces judgment, then moves to the east mountain. That's Ezekiel. Look closely at Mark 13. Jesus leaves the temple after rebuking Israel's false leaders. They've turned the temple into a den of robbers. He stopped after after he's come out of the temple. As he's headed east, out of the east gate, And then he pronounces another judgment on the temple and Israel's wicked leaders. And then Jesus leaves out the east gate and heads to the mountain east of the city, the Mount of Olives. There Jesus promises judgment against Israel, Jerusalem's destruction, and a new salvation where foreigners will be saved. It's totally the same. It's identical to Ezekiel. So this reality has to inform how we read the rest of Mark 13. So before we move on, you must see that God demands His people to be faithful. And He holds His people faith or accountable for their faithfulness or their lack of faithfulness. If God did not spare Israel... He will not spare you if you continually chase after sin. 1,500 years of patience and grace should lead a nation to honor and obey the Lord. You would think. 1,500 years of goodness. But Israel's problem was that they didn't have hearts to obey. They couldn't. They were slaves to sin. The law could not make them new. And beloved, God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. That's Romans 2. So you must give yourself to faithful obedience because God has given you a new heart and a new mind and a new spirit. So we must demonstrate the reality of our faith profession by being one who is consistently and regularly repenting and obeying. 
Believing and repenting, repenting and believing all the time. Christians are humble repenters because the Spirit has opened our eyes to the kindness of God in Christ and helped us to walk after Him. So as we look at the big picture, this is where it gets debatable. I want you to see that Mark 13, 3, all the way to Mark 13, 31, are all referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Now, many people see verses 24 to 27 as the second coming of Jesus. Son of man descending, moon, blood, and dark sun, and all this kind of stuff. I'll explain in a minute why I don't think that's right. Now, back to 13.3. The disciples. When? When's this going to happen, Jesus? What are the signs? What can we look for? Jesus rattles off a number of warnings. Okay, listen, they're going to be false Christ saying, I am He, follow me. Don't be led astray by this false Christ. And we see that many false Christs did come between the time of Christ and the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. The book of Acts alone talks about a man named Thutis, Judas the Galilean, the Egyptian who led thousands into the wilderness. All of these men serving as false messiahs misled Israel. And many others are mentioned by Josephus, and I won't talk about that. But here's the point. Don't be led astray. Don't be led astray. There will be wars, rumors of war, earthquakes, calamities, natural disasters, famines. These aren't the end, Jesus says. When you see these things, they aren't the end. It's just the beginning. It's the birth pangs. But while these signs occur, be alert and on guard because you're going to be delivered over to Jewish and Gentile rulers. Not because of you, but because of Christ. The early Christians are going to suffer before the destruction of Jerusalem. Peter writes this, 1 Peter 4. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? Uh, Non-Christian, I am. If you, if you don't identify with Christ, I'm, I'm really thankful that you're here this morning but because I love the Lord and I love truth I want you to know that the outcome for you if you don't obey the gospel will be far worse than any destruction of Jerusalem and any destruction of a of a temple Christ was stricken and killed for sinners so that sinners would live and be healed he endured God's wrath so his people would en enjoy God's pleasure. So my, my encouragement and exhortation to you, non-Christian, is to repent and to trust this crucified Savior today. The second point. Endure hardship faithfully because Christ has won. All right, again, I know this, this is a lot, a lot of information, a lot of background. Stay with me. We're coming, we're coming to the climax here pretty soon. Jesus warns His disciples that they're going to suffer before Jerusalem falls. And they did. Look at the book of Acts. Herod kills James by the sword. Stephen is stoned. Mark's writing his gospel in Rome, probably in the early 60s. 
before Peter dies. Nero is the emperor at the time. Now, a few years after this gospel, Nero is going to light a fire and it's going to burn a portion of Rome, and he's going to blame the Christians. And what's going to happen before Jerusalem is destroyed? Christians are going to be killed in the Colosseum. Uh, they'll be thrown to gladiators. Our brothers and sisters in the faith were sewn up in animal skins and fed to wild beasts in the Colosseum. Women were dragged to death by bulls in the Colosseum. Peter was crucified upside down. Nero used Christians as living torches in his garden because they shared your faith. Christians suffered before Jerusalem fell. They suffered for the sake of Christ. But look at Mark 13.10. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. So Mark, Jesus and Mark are saying the gospel has to be proclaimed before, to all nations before Jerusalem falls. And Jesus' warning shows us three things. Okay? Suffering, suffering is tied tightly to gospel proclamation here. So three points. Suffering for Christ is the means of gospel advancement for the church in the years leading up to 70 A.D. and the temple's destruction. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, church father Tertullian would say. Second point is Mark is writing verse 10, not as a prophecy, but as a statement of declaration. He, this is going to happen. Or no, this has happened. Not a future prophecy waiting to be fulfilled today. Because if you think about it, Mark is writing in Rome. There are Christians in Rome. He's in the church in Rome. The church is already international. It's gone to the ends of the Roman Empire. And Mark sees this and he's like, it's done. It's been finished. The sign has become true. Third point is that the Lord never abandons His people. Look at this. This should, this should make you smile. God gives His Spirit to His weak children to be His mouthpiece. Even to the most powerful rulers in the world. Don't worry about what you're going to have to say. I'm going to give you the words by my Spirit. You won't be alone. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. So suffering becomes the platform for gospel advancement in the world. And you must not suffer, or you must suffer not for your sin... As Peter warned, you must not suffer for your pride, but for Christ and Christ alone. This suffering Jesus references will be important later, so I'm just going to leave it now. But beloved, today is, today is no different. Listen to this word from J.C. Ryle. True Christianity will cost a man the favor of the world. He must be content to be thought ill of by man if he pleases God. He must count it no strange thing to be mocked, ridiculed, slandered, persecuted, and even hated. If you are not suffering to some degree, and I know that we're all Americans and we live in a wonderful nation of freedom, religious liberty here, but if you are not suffering to some degree for the sake of Christ, then you need to ensure that you are indeed in the faith. Christ says this about the early Christians, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now if you think about it, you can fail to, to endure a race in two different ways, right? Right? You give up 
in the middle of it and walk away? Or you never start? It's one thing to experience unbelievable suffering and to be tempted to give up. I can't deal with this anymore. I can't deal with the suffering for the sake of Christ and then walking away. I don't think that that's the concern for a lot of Americans who, who claim to know Christ. It's another thing to never experience suffering for Christ because you've actually never begun to walk with Him. In light of Christ's warning to the early church, I really want you to examine how is your faith causing you, however small or however large, how is your faith causing you to endure difficulty and suffering? Not saying for you to go out and look for it, but it will come. It will come. Let's look at verses 14 to 23. Jesus unfolds the complete and utter destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. John Kesselring isn't here. I said this for John. Maybe it'll be on the recording, John. Um, Rome's fight against Judea in the late 60s began as a tax revolt. By the end of the 60s, Jerusalem is a massive disaster. Because you have competing Jewish camps within Jerusalem who are killing one another and fighting over control of the temple. The temple is filled with dead bodies as the zealots fight the religious leaders and the Sakari of Israel. And the zealots win that that. Uh, radical political group that we've talked about before, they win. And they install a, a puppet high priest. And then they begin fighting the Roman armies of the general Vespasian. And in verse 14, Jesus says that when you start seeing these signs, Christian Jerusalem is about to fall. So you need to be aware. It's very pastoral. <laughs> Look out. Watch. The abomination of desolation. That's language from the book of Daniel. And what Jesus is talking about is this Roman general, the son of Vespasian, named Titus, who comes. And he replaces his father when his father becomes Caesar. And Titus, when he replaces his father, is at the walls of Jerusalem. And for five months, Rome hammers Jerusalem. Hammers them. The famine caused is horrific. Jesus warns against pregnant women and nursing mothers. And Josephus tells the story of a nursing mother, Mary, the daughter of Eliezer. Uh, who was a wealthy woman, but she had all of her things continually stolen, all of her food continually stolen, stolen by Jewish marauders in the, in the city. And uh, she ends up, while nursing her child, her son, realizes that it, it would be appropriate to roast and eat him, which she does. And this kind of wicked act has already happened before in Israel. In 2 Kings 6, just prior to their, Israel's first judgment under Assyria. Famine's really terrible. 1.1 million Jews, non-combatants, are killed. 100,000 Jews are taken into slavery. It's absolutely horrific. And their destruction serves as a warning to us against sin and hardened hearts. Because that's why the destruction came. Christ warns His people, When you see these things happening, flee Jerusalem, don't even look back. Similar to Lot and his wife, just run. If you're on the roof, don't even go down. Just hop from roof to roof until you get out of the city. If you're in the fields, don't go back into the city to get your cloak. Just run. That's how bad this is going to be. 
And during this time, Jesus warns again that they're going to be false Christ. But this one is different than verse 5 and 6. Because these false Christs are going to aim for God's elect. They're coming for Christians. And this happened. And beloved, as Christ warned the early church, so I warn you, be on guard against false teaching. Christ is warning against false teaching, particularly as it relates to Him coming again. What's the tendency? What's the tendency here? I want to stress this because um, the millions of dollars and millions of Left Behind books that are sold show our fascination with this. Left Behind books are fine. It's not wrong. Uh, I disagree with them. Uh, but they're not wrong. But it just shows our love affair with trying to figure out what's going to happen. When's he going to come? And you start seeing Jesus behind every cloud or under every rock. We are fascinated with trying to figure out how it's going to happen. And that natural curiosity can lead to error. An enormous portion of the New Testament, especially the letters of the apostles, are warning the churches against false teaching, including a wrong idea of the second coming. Paul rebukes the Corinthians for believing that there's no resurrection. He then rebukes the Thessalonians who think the resurrection's already come. Christ has come again. The Thessalonians also believe that in the, in the second Thessalonians, he believes that uh, there, there are church members who believe that Christ's return is so imminent that they don't have to work anymore. And so they stop. And they, they tax the church. Women become gossips. Men become lazy. Peter warns against constantly looking for signs of Christ in the sky or in a prophecy or in a voice from heaven telling you that you have something more sure than all of that. You have God's Word. You have the Scriptures. False teaching is a constant threat. So how do you guard against it? In the same way that the U.S. Secret Service guard against counterfeit. You know the real thing like the back of your hand. So you can spot it like that. So we need to know God's Word backwards and forwards. So you need to put all of your efforts, all, all of your efforts and your devotion into knowing God and knowing His Word rightly understood. Beat it into your heads, beat it into your hearts, and beat it into one another. You have something far more sure than an angelic vision, tea leaves, or some book about adults or kids seeing heaven. You have Scripture. You don't need any more revelation from God to know about Jesus, heaven, hell, or Christ's return. If you have one of those books, heaven is for real, throw it away. You already know heaven is for real. The Bible tells you. You don't need more than the Bible. You must reject false teaching and anyone shouting at you, Hey, look over there. Hey, look over here. I, cannot, I can't believe this, but he's still on the air. Don't listen to Jack Van Empey. If any of y'all know who he is. Man, I grew up watching him. Don't listen to him. Cannot believe. He's like a skeleton. He's so old. It's not an accident that televangelist and end times fanatic Jim Baker was involved in fraud and a sex scandal. He's the guy who said, oh, the Ap Apache helicopters are in Revelation. Uh, he and his new wife now sell survival water and real estate because they say that scientists uh, are, are saying that where they are and the land they're selling is the safest place in the world during Armageddon. And we laugh at that. 
But clearly people believe it and they buy it. You must reject men and teaching like this and you must endure to the end. It's not a one-time profession. It's not saying a prayer. It's not having a revival experience. Christianity is a marathon. You are saved by enduring. It is not a sprint. It is not a one-time event. You endure by doing that which saved you in the first place. Repenting and believing. Repenting and believing. Repenting and believing. Every day, moment by moment, loving God, loving your neighbor, devoting yourself to sound doctrine and teaching in light of the Bible. So up to this point, I've argued that 13, 3 to 31 is speaking of Jerusalem's destruction, including verses 24 to 27. So this is, let's jump into this real quick. In verses 24 and 25. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Jesus is quoting directly Isaiah 13.10 as well as Ezekiel 32, Joel 2, Joel 3, Amos 8. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. All of these Old Testament quotations... refer to God's judgment against sinful nations, including Israel. Israel, Jesus argues, is now being included in all of the Old Testament judgments against all of those foreign nations because Israel is worse than the wicked nations because of their hardened hearts and unrepentance. So God's old covenant people are being tossed out because they don't love Him. Does that make sense? God is rejecting Israel and applying the words of judgment in the Old Testament to Israel. All right, so then in 26 and 27, He says this, And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Jesus is quoting Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And in the context of Daniel 7, Daniel is writing that the Son of Man is coming to the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days is giving the Son of Man all dominion, over all the nations, and he's seating him at the right hand of glory. So Jesus uses the same language in Mark 8, 38, and then again in Mark 14, 62. Three times, and this point is important. Most people think that Jesus is talking about his second coming here. But Jesus is actually talking about how God has vindicated his son by giving him dominion and glory over all the nations, even as Israel has rejected him. Christ has been given the Daniel 7 throne, which is a kingdom that consists of all nations all over the place, which is why the Son of Man will gather all his elect from all corners of the earth. The Son is no longer giving his time and attention solely to Israel. but rather he's rejecting them because of their unbelief. He's now turned to the Gentiles, and so we see a change in this divine government. God draws people to himself by King Jesus, not on the basis of ethnicity, not on the basis of circumcision, but on the basis of faith and repentance in Christ. So God has vindicated Christ and established His rule, and Jesus is telling us that He has shown this vindication in two ways. Two ways. First, hardened, unbelieving Israel is being absolutely crushed. They're the ones saying, hey, no, God's with us. But then they get crushed. 
that's kind of a sign that God is not with you. Secondly, while God crushes Israel, the church explodes. One people die, one people are born and grow like wildfire. God will cause the Son's church to explode. Israel, judgment, God's new creation, grace. So Israel's destruction is the means by which the gospel is going to go to non-Jews. Which is good news for us, right? We're not Jewish. So God vindicates Jesus' message, destroys the wicked... And then as you look at verses 28 to 31, Jesus finally gets to explicitly answering the disciples' question from verse 4. They've asked this question, and he's gone on and on and on about all these different things and tangents. But now he comes back. When you see these things taking place, you know that it is near. These events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem will be like the blossoms and the shoots on a fig tree. When you see them, you know it's coming. When you see false Christ, when you see calamity, when you suffer for my name's sake, then you, then you will see that Jerusalem is destroyed. And you'll know that God has made a decisive turn. And the church will explode. All right, verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in 70 AD, less than 40 years after Jesus said this to his disciples. His word is true, he keeps his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That's good news, beloved. Because he said that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Christ has been vindicated. He's seated at the right hand of glory. He's been given dominion over all things. And you now can endure suffering because Christ has won. Third point. And this is shorter. Be ready and alert because Christ is returning. So verses 32 to 37 marks a major shift. But concerning that day or that hour, he moves to a different time. There's no debate about this. But concerning that day or that hour, again, Old Testament language, no one knows when that's going to happen. Not even the sun. And since no one knows, don't speculate. Don't spend all your time working on end times tables. Show hospitality. Don't overly focus on the news or calamities. Share the good news. Stay awake. I could say that louder for some of y'all. Stay awake. Don't get so zealous about the rapture that you fail to honor your parents. Don't let the Son of God catch you napping on the job when He returns. Because that will be a terrible wake-up call. Mark 13, Jesus is showing us throughout the Scriptures, God has consistently saved His people by judging hardened, unrepentant nations. All judgments from the Old Testament. Sodom and Gomorrah, He saves Lot and Abraham. The Exodus, judges Egypt, brings out Israel. Judgment of Israel in exile, brings them out of Babylon, destroys Babylon all the way up to God's destruction of Jerusalem, where He saves the church, judges unbelieving Israel. And all of these judgments serve as a pale picture, a foreshadow, a, a dim mirror of the judgment that is coming on the last day. I think if we rightly understood the, the last day, 
we would be more motivated to holiness. One only has to read Revelation 14 and 19 to see the judgment coming on the last day will be far more horrific and terrible than anything that we've seen in human history. Revelation 14, the, the blood of the wicked is, is going to come up to the bridles of the horses. That's how deep the blood will be of the wicked. Revelation 19, Christ himself will slaughter the unrepentant wicked with a word. You, you normally don't get those kinds of pictures of Jesus. Until that day comes, Jesus is saying, come to me. I will forgive you by grace. But when he comes again on that last day, Matthew 24 says the people will mourn because it will be too late for them to repent. When he comes again, there is no more grace, only judgment. And if that rubs you the wrong way, gives you some unneed, uh, unease, I, I think what you need to do is you need to realize how horrific your sin is before a holy and just God. When we have problems with the idea of Christ slaughtering the wicked, it's because we don't realize how terrible sin is, particularly our sin. We often don't realize how serious that lustful look that sharp word, that ungodly attitude is until we, dis we see the judgment God has in store for those who will not turn away from their sons. Jerusalem's destruction serves as a kind and pastoral warning to us. You must persevere. You must endure. God will divide the sheep from the goats. He will demonstrate those who are really His. If these religious leaders whose righteousness far surpassed ours were judged, what hope do we have? Christ. Christ. He is our hope. He is our only hope. Cast your trust and hope on the Son of Man who has been vindicated and sits at the right hand of God on high. Love Him with all of your heart and your soul. Ask Him to help you to be on guard. Do not slumber. Do not be lulled to sleep or the Master may come and find you asleep. Praise God that the time of grace is not ended. Today is the day of salvation. All who hope in Christ will be received with gladness. Don't wait until it's too late. Beloved, let us watch for our Christ soberly, humbly, and with faith. Let's pray.